Hello and welcome to another history video about the units of Company of Heroes 2. In this video I will talk about the background of the units of the British faction, the UKF, the United Kingdom Forces. Um, I will talk about uh, the historical accuracy and uh, a bit of background info on what their role was in the war and so you will um, um, learn something about uh, how much of historical accuracy there actually is and uh, sometimes that it isn't really historically accurate. Okay, so here we go. We start with the uh, base unit uh, that you get when uh, you start a game as the UKF and that base unit is the infantry section. Um, the infantry section is uh, consists of uh, riflemen. As you can see I have already used bolster squad so uh, they have five members now. In reality a section would have eight to ten members and um, uh, three sections would form a platoon. The section leader would be armed with a stun gun and all other section members would be armed with the Lee Enfield number no. 4. Well, that's exactly the rifle that you can see on the rifleman here. This is the Lee Enfield uh, number no. 4. It's the successor of the uh, Lee Enfield Mark 1 um, number 3. And it was called the SM. LE, the short magazine Lee Enfield, and it was the most uh, common rifle of the Tommies, as the British forces are referred to regularly in World War I. At the start of the war, the SMLE was still the most widespread rifle in uh, the British Army, and um, the uh, Lee Enfield number no. 4 was its uh, successor. Um, so, the number 4 had a, uh, a vari uh, various advantages over other rifles. For example, the magazine would uh, contain um, 10 bullets instead of the stripper clips of 5, uh, which were being used by most other rifles like the Moshin Nagant uh, from the Russians and the Mauser K98K from the Germans. So this uh, Enfield had an advantage in number of bullets. And uh, British troops uh, used to be trained in uh, uh, firing their rifles really quickly. So uh, uh, while they only had uh, bolt action rifles, the um, intention was to have them being fired in a real fast succession. This practice was uh, started in uh, uh, before World War One, and it was part of a uh, of a practice uh, of training soldiers, which was uh, called um, the practice number 22 from the musketry regulations, and the musketry regulations were published in 1909, and um, this practice number 22 was about a rapid fire and uh, soldiers were trained to uh, fire their guns as fast as they could. This was also uh, this also became known as the mad minute and as uh, there have been some uh, videos on YouTube uh, which are uh, debunking the myth of the mad minute but uh, they were uh, they were uh, uh, actually not really accurate about the real Mad Minute and they were uh, doing some different variations in circumstances and so um, they were about Stangskeeting which is uh, scooting, I don't really know how to pronounce it, but in, Norwe in Norway and um, circumstances were quite different there. 
So, uh, according to ve various veterans, the Mad Minute was a thing, and actually they uh, were practicing it up to World War II, so uh, even in World War II, the infantrymen of the British Army were supposed to fire their rifles as fast as possible. Um, so, the, um, the uh, Lee Enfield rifle is the uh, stock rifle of the uh, infantry sections. The, um, the other equipment on the rifleman is uh, hi that he has a canteen, he has a uh, bayonet over here, the, the large sword blade bayonet from World War I was being uh, dismissed and instead it was uh, replaced by a spike bayonet which was called the big sticker by the soldiers and uh, as you can see uh, not much else um, is being put on the riflemen uh, you can upgrade them with uh, uh, Mills bombs Mills bombs were uh, grenades that were invented uh, uh, in World War One. The Mills bomb was supposed to be a defensive grenade uh, as opposed to the offensive grenades that were used by the Germans. The, um, uh, the German grenades were concussion grenades and uh, their, uh, their uh, um, purpose was to um, uh, have you stunned after the explosion so that you would be lost for a bit and confused and then the attacking troops would uh, be able to take over your position and the Mills bomb is a fragmentation grenade and it's supposed to blow up and have some shrapnel fly around uh, and then um, act like a mini artillery shell and uh, this Mills bomb was also the uh, the, the, the base for the American pineapple grenade and uh, as you can see uh, in the description here it's the number 36 uh, which means it's the latest um, it's the latest variation of the Mills bomb uh, the number 5 was used in World War 1 and um, and the number 36 uh, was used in World War 2 so um, if you think that this really looks like a pineapple grenade then uh, you might be right because uh, the, their designs are uh, very similar because the pineapple grenade was uh, derived from this one um, you can also upgrade the uh, infantry sections with medical supplies and with pyrotechnics and I'm just gonna do that right now so I can later show you what the um, artillery in the base is uh, like. Um, okay, uh, if you unlock the weapon rack in the base building then you can have your infantry section have pick up different weapons. And the infantry uh, most uh, used weapon is the Bren Mark II. Uh, in normal infantry sections in the British Army uh, would consist of 10 men like I told you before and then one of them would carry a Bren gun. This is the Bren Mark II. It's the successor of the Bren Mark I, not very surprisingly. And just like the Americans uh, called everything M1, uh, if it, uh, whether it was a tank, a half-track, a gun or a helmet, the British used Mark to, um, to um, designate uh, various uh, iterations of a weapon or something like that. So this is the Bren Mark II and it had been in service since uh, 1943 I guess and uh, it was the successor of the Mark I which had uh, seen service in North Africa mostly and in um, and also in uh, Sicily and um, the, the Bren gun is a semi-auto uh, gun which is um, being you can which can be used with a bipod as you can see here it can also be fired from the hip and um, uh, usually in uh, infantry sections the Bren gun would be um, used as uh, a flanking move the infantry section would split up the guy with the Bren 
and the uh, assistant section leader would go uh, to a different position uh, they would uh, find a nice position to lay uh, um, to lay down suppressive fire and then the, uh, the assistant uh, section leader would see if the gun was hitting its targets and also if the um, if the if the uh, the rest of the section could move up by uh, by using the suppressed fire being laid down by the Bren. In the late war, uh, uh, the final years, a section could carry two Bren guns, and since you can do that in Company of Heroes 2, uh, it's uh, that actually is quite realistic that you can have a section carry two Bren guns, even though that the section is only five men and not ten, like in uh, reality. Uh, but also, uh, also the um, uh, sometimes in, in reality the section was not really ten guys, but only eight. Um, in uh, th then officially they would be ten, but then in the field they would be eight guys. Okay, the Mark II was in uh, was uh, uh, being used from uh, 1941 on. But um, it uh, it never re it fully replaced the Mark One. The Mark One uh, was in service until the end of the war. Um, but uh, of course, the Mark II was taking over its uh, primary use. Um, you can also pick up the Piat weapon, which is a anti-tank weapon. And uh, the Piat, uh, uh, which you can see here, I'll zoom in so you can see it from up close. This is the Piat, and the Piat has a uh, rocket-like projectile here. And uh, uh, Piat actually stands for Projector Infantry Anti-Tank. And this was the uh, anti-tank weapon which was the successor of the Boys Rifle, of, w uh, of which I will about which I will tell you a bit more later and uh, the Piat uh, was um, um, in use from 1942 onwards it first saw action on uh, Sicily, the invasion of Sicily and um, uh, the it was produced in 1942 and then it saw action from uh, 1943 in Sicily and uh, the real good thing about the, the Piet was that it uh, uh, didn't have a smoke trail because it was uh, spring loaded. So there was a spring inside this barrel and uh, you had to uh, cock it and then uh, if you release the spring then the rocket would be flying towards the target and um, the uh, the rocket itself was uh, called the surface bomb high explosive slash AT um, so the uh, the Piet was um, uh, had an advantage over the bazooka uh, or the Panzer Shrek in as that uh, the gunner could fire its weapon his weapon and then he would still re remain uh, pretty invisible to um, to the uh, enemy. Okay, let's see what happens if uh, we make it fire. Dunk. That's how you do that. And um, that's how you can see how the rocket is being loaded again. And that's actually whoops. What happened there? Okay. Um, that's actually uh, a bit faster than in reality. Um, it was faster in reality to load the gun um, with two men, one guy holding the the weapon and the other guy putting in the rocket and uh, and uh, cocking the spring. Um, so this uh, uh, this concludes our part about the base infantry, the riflemen, the rifle section, the backbone of the British Army. Um, so let's go to the next unit which are the 
Royal Engineers. Uh, here we have the Royal Engineers. The Royal Engineers are wearing leather jackets. They have a large amount of pouches, which suggests that they uh, are supporting a, the brand gunners, which is not really true because uh, yeah, they they can be upgraded with brand guns as well in the base if you unlock the weapon rack. Um, but um, uh, this uh, this outfit with uh, these large pouches is typical for the brand gunner number two in the infantry section, because the brand gunner number two would carry most of the ammo for the brand gun and not the gun itself. That one would be carried by the brand gunner number one. Um, the standard weapon for the Royal Engineers in Company of Heroes 2 is the Sten gun, which is actually the uh, normal weapon for the section leader. And there actually were no uh, units uh, that were totally equipped with Sten guns, uh, except for special forces units like the commandos, about which I will tell you a bit later. Um, the Royal Engineers uh, were actually called in uh, officially the core of Royal Engineers. And um, you can see there's a shoulder patch here. Whoops. Here. And uh, that actually uh, uh, suggests that uh, this is the Royal Engineer patch thingy. Uh, it says Royal Engineers here on the red, uh, on the red strap, shoulder strap, um, and the the leather jackets are uh, for uh, uh, for extra protection, uh, uh, some sort of a light armor thing, and it is also um, uh, useful in uh, rainy weather <laughs> like we have right now in Hamburg. Um, I don't. I'm not really sure if it's if that's the case. Uh, that is really the case with the Royal Engineer. Here they have the bayonet, and this blanket here is the anti-gas blanket, which was also part of the equipment of the regular soldier. And um, uh, because when the uh, war broke out in the 1939, the um, Allies were very much afraid of uh, gas being used like it was in World War I. Uh, the Royal Engineers uh, sometimes uh, tell you when you select them that, uh, s that they are sappers and the word sapper is derived from the French word sap which means spade work or trench and uh, then the, the French uh, were calling their guys who were building these things sapeur and then uh, that became sapper in English. Um, okay, so uh, the sappers or the royal engineers in the uh, in the British Army, they can in Company of Heroes 2, they can uh, throw uh, heat grenades, and uh, this is uh, a bit weird. Uh, what happens here? Because the the British had uh, an AT grenade in real life. It was the number 68 AT grenade. But it totally doesn't look like this picture here. This looks more like an RPG-43 from the Russian army. Uh, so uh, this is actually a bit of a mistake uh, icon-wise. Um, the, of course the, the engineers can build uh, everything um, that you need in uh, forward emplacements. Uh, I'll talk about those later. They can also uh, lay down mines. It's the modified American M6 AT mine and uh, the British did have their own uh, AT mines. So like the smoke grenade, this is a bit of a uh, weird move uh, that they uh, don't have British AT mines uh, properly. Um, you can upgrade the engineers with various pickup weapons and uh, Let's uh, start with the uh, flamethrower. Uh, you can upgrade the, the engineers with the flamethrower uh, when you have cer uh, certain commanders equipped, like the mobile assault uh, uh, commander. And again, uh, the flamethrower is actually an American-made flamethrower. It's the M2, 
and that's um, yeah, that's a, a bit of a shame if you ask me, because uh, like uh, with the mines and with the AT grenades, uh, they could have made it uh, real British if they uh, would have wanted to. They can also be upgraded to heavy sappers in the anvil uh, doctrine, and uh, if you uh, give them the Vickers K, then you can see that this is a Vickers machine gun with a uh, cylinder magazine. That's actually really realistic because this is what the Vickers K looks like. Except for the fact that the Vickers K was actually not meant to uh, to be carried by infantry. The Vickers K was designed to be put on uh, vehicles. So they were mounted on jeeps uh, as and they were mounted as rear guns on planes and they were uh, the also known as the Vickers gas operated and um, uh, actually the, uh, there was, a, a, there was a, 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 s a very rare variant which was called the Vickers Go which stands for gas operated number two mark one land surface and uh, this land variant had a, a short stock and as you can see on this model here, this is not really a short stock, it is pretty large. So, um, although they did exist, the, um, the Vickers uh, land service uh, gun is not really in uh, Company of Heroes 2. Um, so, and they were also actually uh, only meant to uh, be uh, used by RAF airfield defense units and um, you are almost never defending an airfield in Company of Heroes 2 so that's a bit weird okay we'll make a short stop uh, at the uh, recovery units uh, because this is the Royal Engineer Recovery Squad they have uh, a minesweeper uh, their equipment is similar, they have 10 guns as you can see here and um, they have a special ability which is salvage and they can uh, get resources from uh, vehicles or weapon racks uh, which is quite funny actually because that's super unrealistic of course um, you, uh, and except for the fact that you could maybe uh, uh, at least from uh, broken weapons you uh, it's not a very wise idea to get ammo out of that but um, and uh, it's also the question if you can use ammo which is uh, from enemy vehicles it's uh, you never know if it fits yours it has to be the same caliber and everything so that's a bit uh, tricky uh, they also have a throw uh, they also uh, uh, are able to throw smoke grenades and this is a bit like with the um, with the uh, the flamethrower and the mines, because the smoke grenade has a picture of the Russian smoke grenade, which was also uh, um, unrealistic in itself. But the um, uh, the British did have a smoke grenade, which was the number 77 grenade. It was a white phosphorus grenade and it could be thrown uh, and then the smoke screen was also a, a, a lightly poisonous so um, this number 77 grenade could be used defensively and offensively um, and um, it was uh, very uh, dangerous uh, because the, uh, the when the grenade exploded the contents scattered and ignited as soon as they touched the air so um, this uh, grenade uh, is uh, unrealistic in Company of Heroes 2 itself. Okay, then on to the next unit. These guys are the uh, tank hunter infantry section guys. They also have the not so very realistic AT grenade and they are carrying an AT rifle which you can see here. This AT rifle which of which the magazine is detached from the model for some reason um, is uh, the boys uh, AT rifle 
and um, if you want to know if the boys AT rifle is a realistic weapon then I can be very short about that it is a realistic weapon the problem of the boys AT rifle which you can see here is that the magazine is floating underneath while in reality it would be on top the boys AT rifle had uh, several marks and uh, mark 1 was in use from uh, 1937 onwards and uh, in 1940 these guns were phased out because um, they could fire at enemy armor and uh, be useful against Panzer 1, Panzer 2 and the early versions of the Panzer 3 but when the German tanks were being up armored the AT rifles became obsolete uh, you can see that this AT rifle has a large uh, muzzle brake or something on the front it's a, a flat a flat end at the muzzle brake and um, uh, that means that this is not a Mark 1 because the Mark 1 had a circular muzzle brake um, uh, like I said when I was talking about the Piat this, uh, this uh, AT rifle was succeeded by the Piat in 1943 and um, the so they uh, were in use uh, from uh, after they uh, after the production had stopped um, and uh, 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 the AT gun uh, the AT rifle was carried uh, by uh, by uh, infantry sections which were uh, which had a specialized role so if w there was a rifle platoon uh, in uh, in the early years of the war then uh, it uh, then an AT rifle would be designated to uh, one of the sections um, and although usually uh, the sections didn't receive boys AT rifles uh, in a standard way um, so um, this extremely flat muzzle brake thing is a bit uh, special and uh, the tank hunters uh, are only useful against light vehicles because uh, like in reality they can't be used against uh, tanks um, like the Tiger or the Panther or even the Panzer IV. Um, this weapon is shared by this unit which is a bit weird because uh, this is uh, supposed to be the sniper and uh, whereas you can use the AT rifle as a sniper rifle and it actually was used in that way uh, by the way we can see that the magazine is placed correctly here so maybe it's just something with the tank hunter infantry uh, unit uh, the sniper has uh, a 0.55 cal uh, rifle and that's actually the, the, uh, the anti-tank rifle um, caliber so that's correct and uh, uh, you can see that in the description it says that this this is the boys anti-tank rifle and um, even though it's called armor piercing uh, it uh, it's also called a sniper and uh, real snipers in the British Army uh, would not use boys AT rifles they would use uh, number four uh, rifles with scopes on them so whereas the description is correct the um, the real snipers in the British Army would never use the boys AT rifle so that's a bit weird okay on to the special units uh, of which we have here the uh, commandos the commandos the models are pretty nicely done they are uh, pretty realistic uh, when it comes to equipment because the British commando actually looked like this um, they had um, they had uh, uh, sh uh, they actually had shoes instead of boots and uh, this is suggesting that they might be shoes indeed um, because uh, boots were too heavy for uh, most uh, missions and uh, they had this woolen cap uh, uh, they w could also wear barrettes and uh, if they were wearing barrettes they could wear uh, several colors but um, the, um, the green 
color uh, beret was the one which was usually used for uh, commandos. Uh, you can see that they have a rope around their body and uh, which is um, being used on missions so they can uh, climb uh, cliffs or mount uh, uh, bunkers or scale walls um, so uh, that's what the uh, rope is used for they have um, a knife on the side the commando knife there were uh, there were various types of knives in the uh, British arm army, but um, there was the uh, Fairbairn Sykes knife uh, was the m uh, most uh, commonly used one by the commandos. And uh, you can also see that this uh, weapon here looks like a sten, but it doesn't look the same as the stens from the Royal Engineers, and that's because these are silenced stens. And um, actually, in um, in game, you hear some uh, some uh, pew 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 uh, like sound uh, for the silenced sten, um, which is not really realistic because subsonic sounds were not uh, doable yet in World War II. Uh, they were quieter than normal stens, and that's why they were silenced. And uh, Mark III sten. Uh, uh, is the silenced one and um, the commandos were a special unit uh, which was uh, uh, founded in the beginning of the war because the, uh, the British wanted to have a unit which could infiltrate and um, uh, d uh, do raids on the coast of France for example and uh, uh, they started. Uh, they started with uh, soldiers that volunteered for the special service brigade, and um, the commandos would be uh, uh, growing uh, throughout the war. And by the end of the war, 25,000 guys had passed uh, the training in uh, Scotland. Um, so the uh, commando uh, course was uh, was pretty intense because you could uh, you would be uh, you should be able to uh, operate in small units in enemy territory, and um, the uh, the commando units uh, were also um, the proving ground for uh, uh, the several other special units like the. Royal Marines commandos, the uh, parachute regiments, the special air service and the special boat service, uh, which is pretty cool. And uh, they also inspired uh, other countries to do uh, 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 similar units. And uh, they had some uh, various, uh, they had some uh, really uh, famous encounters with the Germans in occupied uh, France and in Norway. Uh, also in the Netherlands and on the uh, Channel Islands and um, uh, most uh, famous uh, uh, were the raiding forces that were uh, uh, taking part in the uh, raid of uh, uh, Dieppe the, they were um, uh, ac they were actually uh, part of uh, raids in uh, Norway uh, the uh, some uh, real uh, um, operation anklet for example and um, in France they uh, they were being used and in the on d-day for example and uh, they had some um, uh, they had some uh, uh, big part in uh, the Normandy landings uh, where they were uh, fighting in uh, Wistraham, which is uh, which is also part of. If you if you watch the longest day, the classic war movie, you will see the commandos fighting in Wistraham, and uh, they were also fighting at Pegasus Bridge, where the paratroopers had secured the bridge and they were uh, supporting them, and uh, they were also. Uh, um uh, they were also uh, um, uh, had the main task of conquering the town of Port en Bassin, which was a port that they needed uh, for more logistics. And in the Battle of the Scheldt 
in uh, 1944, the Special Service Brigade uh, was carrying out a seaborne assault on Walcheren, uh, while the Canadian uh, divisions were attacking across the causeway. Um, so, the commandos, they have some special abilities, they can ambush, and uh, this is the... Um, uh, it says here that the integrated suppressor and the subsonic ammo of the Mark VI Sten is uh, 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 used for taking out uh, enemies. Well, like I said, it wasn't really subsonic ammo, but um, uh, it, it was the closest thing they could get to in World War II. Uh, they can throw gammon bombs. The gammon bomb is a, a special kind of plastic explosive. It was designed by Captain R.S. Gammon of the 1st Parachute Regiment. And the gammon bomb was uh, supposed to replace the sticky bomb. Because the sticky bomb was pretty dangerous. Because as the name it says, it was sticky. And if it was sticking to something that you didn't want to explode, you were in bad luck. Because then it would explode anyway. The, um, the gammon bomb was uh, an uh, improvised hand-thrown bomb, and uh, it was uh, it was part um, uh, the, the 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 payload was packed with uh, in uh, uh, a piece of cloth, and then uh, you would uh, uh, put it together with a simple uh, igniting uh, system, and then you could throw it away, and then it would explode on impact. So um, the good thing about it is that if the gammon bomb uh, was not prepared, it was not dangerous because you had the explosives and the uh, ignition um, device separately. And the uh, good thing was also that you could, um, you could adjust the amount of explosives yourself. So you could uh, make a light gammon bomb or a, a medium or a heavy gammon bomb depending on the amount of explosives that you would put into it. So, um, uh, uh, this, uh, this was a very nice and uh, field, op uh, field modifiable um, uh, explosive grenade. Okay, uh, we're going to the next unit which uh, seems uh, similar because this is also a commando but uh, uh, this uh, part of the video will be mostly about this guy here. He has a red beret and uh, that means that he is fr uh, from the parachute uh, brigade and um, the, uh, uh, the uh, paratroopers were formed in uh, 1941. The, um, uh, uh, the first one was the first airborne division and uh, in, um, in uh, Great Britain, they were really impressed by the success of the Fallschirmjäger. And that's kind of ironic, because whereas the uh, Germans were uh, abandoning paratrooping, paratroops, uh, paratroop landings after uh, Crete, the uh, British and uh, other allies were actually taking over the practice. So, um, and because they were pretty uh, operational in... Um, I mean, they were pretty uh, important in the invasion of Normandy. Uh, you could say that this uh, little twist of irony in history uh, t uh, took a large part, uh, a large role in the liberation of uh, Europe. Um, so this guy, the air landing officer, is uh, 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 he can. Uh, support uh, infantry uh, with enemy raids and uh, his red beret is also uh, showing the um, uh, the identification symbol of the paratroopers maybe or I can't I can't really zoom in that far um, it doesn't really look like it it looks like it's the uh, the emblem of the British Army and uh, I don't see the Pegasus horse uh, which is uh, the identification symbol of the parachute brigades. Um, but uh, the parachute brigades uh, have as, uh, much in common with the commandos uh, because uh, they were derived from the commandos. They also have the gun and bomb and this guy can do a battle cry. 
uh, which is uh, quite funny of course because uh, battle cry is something really ancient but um, well if it's successful why would you not use it um, this guy has large boots uh, and contrary to the commandos which have the shoes and he has the jumping gloves uh, from the paratroopers uh, actually I would love to have a real paratroop unit in uh, for the UKF in Company of Heroes 2 but we have to deal with uh, the air landing officer by himself because there are no other paratroopers in game so this concludes the part about the infantry let's continue with the team weapons uh, we have here the Vickers heavy machine gun team which uh, has uh, the well let's deploy them come on guys deploy the gun very good okay so the Vickers machine gun it's uh, um, it's a four-man team whereas in reality the crew would consist of three guys it's actually pretty similar as the uh, things I told you about uh, machine gun teams in the other videos um, the uh, especially uh, the MG42 because it has uh, it has the same uh, the same uh, properties it has four men just like the MG42 crew whereas in reality it would be three and just as with the MG42 the ammo box is flying in the air next to the barrel of the gun which is a bit stupid um, because it's not possible um, what is realistic is that this uh, barrel is really huge because it's a water-cooled uh, machine gun it was based on the Maxim gun of the late 19th century and uh, Maxim was uh, also in use by the Soviets of course and uh, the Vickers gun uh, was uh, uh, the Mark I Vickers and it was used in the First World War and uh, they continued to use it in the Second World War. Um, the Vickers gun uh, became the heavy machine gun after the Lewis gun was uh, uh, replacing it as the light machine gun uh, for infantry that was uh, supposed to attack enemy trenches and um, the Vickers gun uh, could fire uh, longer in succession than the MG42 because the MG42 was an air-cooled machine gun and the barrel of the MG42 would overheat a lot faster than the one from the Vickers heavy machine gun. So um, while the uh, rate of fire was lower than the MG42 the Vickers could continue firing for a uh, a longer period of time. Um, the water that was in uh, the next to the barrel would uh, uh, start boiling after a while and then the steam would be let out through a valve and actually I think it's this little thing over here. Um, so um, nice attention to detail there. And there's not really a lot to say about the uh, Vickers except for the fact that the tripod was super heavy and uh, just as the gun itself so the three guys of the crew would each carry uh, one part the gun the tripod and the third guy would carry the ammo boxes um, let's go to the next team weapon which is the AT gun yeah, let's do the AT gun. Why not? Um, put it down, guys. Okay, this is the qu Ordnance Quick Firing 6 pounder AT gun. Uh, it has a funny detail because it says Achilles over here. And Achilles is actually the British name for uh, the um, tank destroyer, which was adopted from uh, the American M10. And um, the 6 pounder was uh, an AT gun which was uh, developed in the um, in the beginning of the war it was in service uh, from uh, 1942 onwards and um, it was uh, uh, the crew of the AT gun w in reality consisted of six guys instead of the four that you get in Company of Heroes 2 um, 
This, uh, uh, this gun saw first action in uh, 1942 in North Africa and it replaced the two-pounder uh, which was just like the boys AT rifle not up to par with the up-armored uh, German tanks anymore. By 1942 the Germans were using late vari variations of the Panzer III and some versions of the Panzer IV and the two-pounder just couldn't uh, do the job anymore. So uh, it was replaced by the six-pounder and uh, the, uh, that meant that the 25-pounder, which was also used as an AT gun, uh, could be reverted to its intended artillery role. More about the 25-pounder later. Uh, this gun was adopted by the United States Army and there uh, they uh, were producing it under the designation uh, M157 millimeter. And I've already shown that one in the video about the American uh, infantry and team weapons in uh, uh, Company of Heroes 2. So, uh, there were several variations of the, uh, of the um, six pounder and uh, very likely uh, this one is um, the variation with the muzzle brake because you can see there's a muzzle brake here at the end and um, it uh, is uh, most likely this one is the Mark IV L50 with the uh, single baffle muzzle brake. Um, the uh, six-pounder was uh, the gun that uh, took out the first uh, Tigers and the first Panthers uh, 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 for the Western Allies in the Second World War. And uh, they could do that because there was uh, some new uh, ammo designed. Um, uh, the new ammo uh, was uh, supposed to be uh, uh, better at taking out um, heavy armor, so the first Tigers were taken out by regular AP uh, armor, uh, ammo, I mean, armor piercing uh, ammo, but later the uh, development of more sophisticated ammunition uh, like uh, armor piercing composite rigid, APCR, and uh, armor piercing discarding sabot, the APDS, uh, was available from 1944 and uh, those uh, ammo types fired by the six-pounder could penetrate both the Tiger and the Panther from the front, which is really uh, useful, of course. Um, so, the, uh, the gun was uh, in infantry units, it was the only used AT gun, and in Royal Artillery Regiments, the six-pounders were joined by 17-pounders from 1943 onwards, uh, more about the 17-pounder later. So, let's move on to the rarest weapon of the UKF of all. This is the Land Mattress. Um, as you can see in the description, it was named after its naval counterpart, the Sea Mattress. And the Sea Mattress uh, has uh, a, l a lot of uh, rockets and um, this was a very rare weapon. I could not really find the exact number that was produced, but I found a nice article on this one and it was uh, talking about two batteries being in use uh, at the same time, consisting of 12 of these uh, monsters. Uh, which means that if there were uh, two batteries in use and according to the article there were two other batteries that were being sent to France when the first two uh, had to be uh, refit and repaired, then uh, at most there were uh, 24 of these in total produced, which is extremely rare, of course. Um, this was um, this was some sort of a ragtag uh, machine. It was um, it was uh, uh, built from various. Uh, parts like the the carriage, the rocket launch system, and the rockets themselves, they were all a bit like uh, well the the article I read about it, uh, the it was giving the impression that the um, the land mattress didn't really have a lot of priority uh, with the um, with the the 
the general staff of the army. So uh, that's why they had to put it together from parts that were a bit obsolete or not n uh, needed anymore in other units. So um, they were uh, they were just uh, sc scrambling it uh, together. Um, reloading this thing uh, was a very uh, uh, very tedious task because every rocket had to be loaded individually and as you can see this one has a uh, rack with 30 rockets uh, which means that uh, it would take about uh, an hour to um, to reload the whole thing and uh, the uh, the rockets uh, had to be put in really carefully because if they were being put in sloppily then uh, it could be that they would uh, ignite and explode upon firing uh, which would damage the tube and then uh, the mattress couldn't be used anymore um, let's have it fire at the target for a bit so you can see that the carriage is set up here and now it's firing the rockets the rockets are actually leaving the tubes. So, and now the reload will start and, and that will take a long time which is realistic because like I said it was a manual job every rocket had to be put back in the tube really carefully in order to not damage the tube on the next launch um the uh the land mattress can also fire uh, white phosphorus shells i didn't read anything about those the only pictures i have seen were the yellow tipped rockets uh that i just fired with the normal uh barrage so i'm really not sure if this white phosphorus um shells uh, really existed Okay, so uh, this concludes the part about all team weapons. Uh, let's go to the emplacements. This is the mortar emplacement. Uh, it has uh, three inch mortars and um, the three inch mortar was the Mark II mortar uh, from the British Army. The Mark I was the Stokes and the Stokes was used in World War I but uh, they wanted a better mortar with uh, a larger range so they were uh, developing the Mark II. Um, they wanted uh, um, the Mark II uh, to be uh, operational in World War II. Uh, it didn't have the range uh, that for example the, the German Granatwerfer 34 had so they were trying to improve on the range and uh, they actually uh, uh, improved it from 1600 yards to 2800 yards um, by about 1942. Um, even though it's called the three inch mortar, uh, it's actually, uh, its caliber is actually 3.209 inch, uh, which means uh, 81.5 millimeters and 81 millimeters also the caliber of the uh, American mortar, standard mortar. Um, the, uh, uh, the mortars were uh, being placed in pits, uh, but uh, usually not in emplacements like these, because this looks a bit like a trench-like emplacement with boards on the side, and that's a whole lot of work. In uh, the field, these mortars were used in uh, in uh, foxhole-like uh, pits where they were dug in and then the crew could sit in cover and fire the mortars out uh, which uh, is quite realistic but this is not really realistic especially not because well if you have a lot of explosives next to you why in uh, why in uh, everyone's name would you ever place fuel drums next to it because these are uh, bombs by themselves uh, if uh, a counter battery uh, uh, if there would be counter fire to your mortar pit 
while you would have these barrels placed around then you would uh, die a very horrible death inflamed in uh, the uh, sea of fire uh, caused by the exploding barrels around you so that is pretty stupid of you guys uh, uh, British soldiers never put uh, uh, gasoline or fuel uh, where you don't need it because this is well pretty unwise I would say um, okay let's have them fire at something They are turning around the mortars to fire at the target. And then they are putting in the rockets. They can uh, adjust the range and the elevation here with the wheels. Just like with the normal mortars that are not in uh, emplacements. Um, I don't know if it's so realistic that uh, the tubes are vibrating so much on upon firing because I think actually that if they would do so then the fire would become really inaccurate so one more shot and then you guys are ready and uh, in reality the mortar crew would consist of uh, three guys uh, usually but uh, here they have two and um, that's actually uh, more realistic than uh, four in most other armies in Company of Heroes 2 because uh, two guys can handle the mortar quite well uh, if you don't need a spotter. Maybe they had spotters out and the spotting for the mortar was, divide, uh, uh, was uh, diverted to uh, scout units. Okay, the next emplacement is the Bowforce gun. This is the Bowforce anti air quick firing gun. The QF 40 millimeter, qu uh, QF standing for quick firing, just like with the quick firing six pounder. Uh, the Bowforce uh, was a Swedish uh, anti air gun, and uh, of course, because it was an anti air gun, its purpose was to down planes. Um, so, the it was in the designed in the 1930s, and um, they were uh, in service uh, from 1934 onward and uh, over 60,000 of these were built. The British were adopting these in uh, 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 just uh, uh, right before uh, World War II broke out. In 1937 they were testing the quick firing 40mm Mark I. Um, the one in game is, uh, is probably the quick firing 40 millimeter uh, Mark III, because thi this one became the army's standard light AA weapon. Uh, the shields were already there on the Mark I. The shields were there to protect the gunners, um, which you can see here. Uh, these are the shells, and uh, when it's firing, the shells have to be loaded into this compartment here. And every time in one shell is fired, the other shells will lower down. And uh, well, let's uh, see if we can show that by firing. Yeah. And new shells are being loaded in. Boom, boom. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, good job, guys. Okay, so. Um, of course this was an anti-air gun, uh, in game you use it mostly against ground targets because uh, uh, planes are few and far between and only available through commander abilities. So if you are playing against uh, Germans uh, that don't have um, a commander with planes then your uh, Bofors will only fight against infantry. Um, the Bofors was also uh, used on ships in uh, various uh, iterations with several barrels and uh, but on the ground it was uh, the single barrel one uh, it had a lot of uh, success therefore it uh, kept being developed even after the second world war um, and uh, the uh, the British were uh, really satisfied with uh, the Bofors gun um, because they were building a lot of those 
in uh, World War II and uh, in 1942 the production uh, had reached uh, about uh, six and a half thousand so um, this concludes the part about the Bofors gun the last gun that we will visit is the 17 pounder gun this is also an AT gun it's uh, the one that was supposed to uh, um, support the quick firing six pounder as we have seen before this one also mentions Achilles which is a bit weird the 17 pounder was not on the Achilles um, but uh, it was on the Firefly um, uh, but I will talk about the Firefly in the video of um, the vehicles um, this uh, uh, this gun has an ability which is called the piercing shot and uh, uh, the 17 pounder was uh, supposed to be able to uh, fight the heavier tanks um, when the Tiger tank uh, appeared in the North African campaign the first 117 pounders were quickly sent to uh, North Africa to uh, try and kill those Tigers um, so uh, when they were sent they were actually still prototypes so the carriers were not finished yet and they were, car uh, they were mounted on carriages of 25 pounder gun howitzers so uh, the early weapons were called 1725 pounders and uh, known under the code name Pheasant. Uh, the fully developed 17 pounders, they were uh, ready in 1943 and they were started being used in the Italian campaign. Uh, super effective uh, and um, uh, very popular uh, with the crews because they could uh, pierce all enemy uh, tanks that were on the field by then. So um, the uh, this one is uh, most likely it's the the one uh, the uh, the version which we see in game is most likely the um, Mark V um, because the 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 uh, Mark V was uh, a, a version of the Mark IV. The Mark IV was used for uh, tanks and uh, actually the Mark IV was put on the Firefly and the Mark V was put on the Achilles so what I said earlier about the Achilles uh, that was actually an, uh, a mistake because uh, uh, actually Achilles on this gun is more logical than on the six pounder in that case okay so uh, uh, well uh, I was talking about the 25 pounder and that it had a carriage which was being used for this 17 pounder and the 25 pounder is over here the 25 pounder uh, is manned by a tank commander model here and uh, they are assisted with uh, by uh, uh, engineer models the 25 pounder was the, the uh, uh, standard uh, howitzer for the British Army it was also called the Ordnance Quick Firing 25 pounder. I can't really select it because uh, then I select the platoon command post, which is not uh, the weapon itself, of course. But the 25 pounder was an artillery gun, uh, which is the major British field gun during the Second World War. Um, it was introduced just before the war started uh, it could be used as uh, uh, indirect and as direct fire and um, the, uh, the direct fire uh, function was used in North Africa against tanks until the 17 pounder uh, came on the field like I said before um, the British had a 4.5 inch howitzer and an 18 pounder before uh, those were the main field artillery units in the first world war and uh, they uh, wanted to have a better gun for the second world war so um, the, uh, they were uh, uh, evolving into the 25 pounder 
A difference between the 18 pounder and the 25 pounder was that the 25 pounder was separate loading, the shell was loaded and rammed and then the cartridge in its brass case was loaded and the breech closed. Um, and so uh, uh, that was a different way of loading uh, the artillery guns. Um, the uh, the Mark I ordnance uh, was still put on 18 pounder carriages and uh, later the Mark II uh, got a new uh, carriage and uh, in 1943 uh, a separately bagged increment charge was added and uh, it was uh, uh, it could uh, fire with a higher velocity so the gun could be used as an AT gun. Um, this, uh, uh, this created the need for a muzzle brake, which we can see here at the end of the barrel. And um, this, uh, uh, this changed, of course, the look of the gun. Um, the gun detachment comprised of uh, six guys, a detachment commander, uh, a guy who operated the breech and rammed the shell, uh, a layer, a loader, and, uh, and two ammo guns. Guys, um, and uh, there was also a reduced detachment, and they were four guys. So uh, in the game, we can th see that it's three, which is a bit too little, but uh, well, that's uh, all uh, really explainable, of course. Um, mostly used in North Africa, these guns uh, were uh, responsible for a lot of uh, anti-tank duties and um, if we would just send our guys uh, here then um, uh, we can see what happens if the pyrotechnics are used and uh, the gun will fire at the designated area and flatten almost everything because the shells uh, were um, uh, in the end, the shells were uh, uh, 105 millimeter, um, and as you can see, this is pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, uh, check the explosives; it's really heavy. And the other gun is also firing at the target. So... Uh, this is a pretty heavy barrage, of course. And uh, uh, in-game you can flatten almost uh, anything uh, below a large structure. Uh, set up trucks will be a bit of a problem in one go but uh, bunkers and smaller buildings like that will be gone after one of these barrages. So, uh, this concludes our uh, video about the uh, UKF and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, look out for the video which will be about the vehicles of the British and then thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and have a nice day.